This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot Show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. So this is the second half of the season finale review of Mr. Robot uh, Python Part 2. Again, um, I'm consolidating all the stories. So the first uh, part of the discussion was about the minor characters of Joanne Wellick, Moby and Trenton, and Leon and Philip Price. And now we're at the heart of the season finale with Dom, Darlene, the FBI, Elliot, Angela, our special guest stars, uh, Tyrell, Wellick, White Rose, and I guess you can say a recurring player, Mr. Robot, in it, in it of himself. So let's uh, begin. We're going to begin with Dom and Darlene and the FBI. So we begin basically moments after the instance, the, essentially the aftermath of the, the massacre that, that occurred at the diner. You have Dawn, and she has blood like all over her. Uh, she points out it's not hers. Um, she's being examined by the doctor. Uh, she's in the in the room in the hospital with uh, the doctor Santiago, and I'm assuming the other FBI agent is like a an after actions FBI agent, probably there to either watch her or examine her or, or question her about the shooting, which is you know pretty standard procedure if you watch any crime drama stuff. But Dom, um, she has you know other ideas. She wants to kick things into high gear. Santiago's trying to calm her down. I mean, she's basically accusing Santiago indirect way of being responsible for the massacre that occurred at the diner. It turns out that Cisco died, and so did nine other people. And Santiago was like, well, really? I think I'm responsible for civilian casualties because what she said was, you know, you should never put that APB out on Cisco. This is the Dark Army. They were tracking them. They found him. They, you know, basically killed him. They're killing everyone. People are disappearing. We need to stop this. We need to warn people. And Santiago is like um, kicking everybody out of the room. He's going to talk to Dom. Just a one-on-one her and, 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 you know, basically he being the boss. I'm still extremely suspicious of Santiago, even though he's demonstrated that he's somewhat competent of a person and that he, he may in fact, have Dom's back, but we still don't know who the mole is within the FBI. It could be somebody higher up. It could be somebody on the side that's, you know, receptionist and secretary and is just forward, forwarding, excuse me, all this information to uh, White Rose, to the Dark Army. But he's, he's, he's still got the same guy for me. And, again, he's trying to slow Dom's role, and Dom's like, we got to stop all this, and he's like, you don't know what's happened. He goes, I know what's happened. We're losing witnesses. People are, we got to round people up. We got to take things to the next level. We got to bring this up to the chain of command. And he goes, E Corp just got bailed out. Two trillion dollars. The global economy has been saved. A no interest loan. And she goes, we need to tell people this is a trap. This dark army. I mean, they, they killed our friends. They killed our witnesses. We got to tell people. He goes, no, honey. <laughs> Look, honey. I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate the fact that you admit that you're not accusing me of, of being complicit to a massacre, but the narrative is set. The narrative is set before the bodies dropped. This is happening. There's nothing that's going to undo it. There's nothing that's going to change. And she goes, how is this possible? How are they even doing this? This is like a this is a trap. This is a China. There's going to be a war. And he goes, right now, the world has been saved. And China's responsible for saving the world. And that's all basically all anybody cares about. And he's like, I just need you to go home, cool down a bit. She goes, I want to be there for the interrogation. And that interrogation is for Darlene. And he goes, fine. So he, like, sends her home. What I find very interesting is that Santiago acknowledges that there is a conspiracy. He agrees with Dom, and there is some evidence, if you will, that there is a conspiracy, but it's not tangible enough for them to, you know, start kicking rocks. So at this moment, Dom seems like almost kind of like the the crazy person, the person screaming in the woods, you know, the lone voice, if you will, but but she's really not. You know, San Diego is there with her. It's just, they, they're just going to have to play this smart, if you will. So she goes home. Starts talking to Alexa, kind of questioning reality, what love is, the purpose of human existence, if you will. 
she just seems very defeated, very like just kind of broken. It is understandable. I mean, just within a couple weeks before the shooting, she just lost her colleagues um, in China. Uh, she's been working on this case for who knows how long. And I question how long, and we'll talk about that towards the end of this, how long she's been working on this case. People, you know, they, you know, they, she keeps getting roadblock after roadblock. She's not, she's not getting her man, if you will. So it's the next day, if you will, or later on that day, and her and Santiago are sitting down with Darlene and having a bit of a tit for tat. Uh, Santiago is going all kind of get mo on Darlene, stating that under the Patriot Act, she has no right. She doesn't have a lawyer because uh, Darlene was evoking her Fourth Amendment right, and she wanted a lawyer. And Dom was like, let me take a different approach. And Santiago leaves. And she kind of goes for this tits for tat for Darlene, trying to talk to her. She knows, she, she Dom's like, I apologize. You know, I'm sorry for the loss of your, your boyfriend there. Um, it seems that, you know, he really loves you. And she goes, we, you know, Darlene's just, you know, kind of a bit snarky. Um... She knows what does that have to do with anything. You know, all we were doing was just sitting in the diner, having a meal. I have no idea what what has happened, and now he's you know he's dead. And she goes, you know, Vincent, your friend that you dropped off at the hospital. You know, he just had a broken collarbone. He's going to be fine. But your other friends, you know, the ones that survived the wreck and are in uh, D.C. part of the D.C. Um, prank that they pulled off. And Dom's like, you know, I thought that was pretty funny. And Darlene was like, you know, it's kind of funny how, you know, people in power can't can't take a joke. And all, you know, people get punished for that. You know, go through all these uh, crimes, if you will, but they get away with all these type of crimes. And Dom kind of continues, kind of not acknowledge it, but kind of ignores it a little bit. She goes, you know, they're all saying that you're the ringleader. And Darlene's like, I'm not sure what you're talking about. You know, we found the house. I still don't know what you're referring to. You know, we still haven't found Susan Jacobs. And Darlene's kind of quiet about it. But, you know, we're looking for her. We're looking in the house. And he goes, you know, if you have something, you need to charge me with something. And Don was like, you know, I understand what's going on. You know, we found all this equipment. And she presents this equipment, the, the, the video equipment. And we're going to match it to those F Society videos. And Darlene's like, what, me and my boyfriend like to, you know, Shoot porn. Is that a crime now? The FBI is interested in our porn activities? And so Darlene is trying to deflect, 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 and a lot of it is, you know, conceivably very believable means of deflecting that she has no ties to this, that she she's uh, free, if you will, from any attachments to what's going on. And Dom, you know, acknowledges her, the fact that she's pretty brilliant, and, you know, they haven't found the F Society tapes. They're all gone. They obviously scrubbed it. The house that uh, Susan Jacobs has scrubbed, you know, is completely clean. And then she comes with the, the big old joker. She pulls out a little baggie, and inside that baggie is that bullet casing from the very first. She goes, you know, we talked to your friend, Vinnie Jones, and he says that you stole his gun. And she's like, well, that sounds like that's his problem. I don't really know what he's talking about, but I don't even know about anything about any gun. And Darlene was, she's just, not Darlene, but Dom is just kind of like kind of shaking the bag. She goes, we found this at the... The fun house, your little headquarters that you had. And Darlene seems a little shook by that because it doesn't make any sense. But she just, again, she's just reflecting. There's like, there's a little tit for tat that's going on here. So Dom ends up, you know, leaving the room, kind of leaving the Darlene to stew there. And she, she talks to her boss, Santiago. And Santiago's like, she has this plan and he's not completely for it. He's saying, you know, the oversight is going to come down on them. You know, everything might, in fact, kind of get shut down a little bit because of the shooting. But Dom says, you know, let me do this play. I know who she is. She's just like me. We're both Jersey girls. Let me do what, what needs to be done. We need to do this. All our witnesses are disappearing or dead. The Dark Army's cleaning up. We got one shot at this. This is the way to do it. So the play is to basically show Darlene everything. You know, I mean everything. I mean everything. She, uh, Opens the interrogation room, pulls Darlene out. She's not in cuffs. She gets the rock star treatment and she walks through the FBI bullpen. And you get this um, really fantastic music. I think we might do a little bit of an episode about just the aesthetics 
in of this show, like the cinematography, the background, the music. Um, maybe we'll get in depth and talk about that a little bit. But she gets the rock star treatment. She's walking through the bullpen. She's getting the stink eye from all the FBI agents. And Dom, you know, has a little bit of a narration overview as she's going through the walkthrough. And she, she says that, you know, over 6,322 FBI agents are working on this case alone. And she turns to Darlene and she's like, you know, because now they're in the, the final room, the room where all the information is at. We're all part of this biggest event in world history. Darlene's like, I'm, I mean, I'm not special. And Dom says, I can, I'm going to change your mind. And, of course, th- like throughout the entire season finale, there's these brownouts are happening, these brownouts are happening. As she's walking, Darlene's walking into the, the final room where all the information's at. And in his room with Dom, and Dom's just looking at her as Darlene's staring at these whiteboards. And on these whiteboards are just like all these little lines and pictures of everybody. There's Angela, Elliot, uh, Darlene's on there herself. Uh, there's the Cisco. There's um, one of uh, Elliot's co-workers from Allsafe, Gideon's on the board. Joanne Wellick's on the board. We find out the name of uh, Mr. Sutherland, the bodyguard to the Wellicks. Uh, his name is Donald Hoffman. He's on the board. And there are all these intersecting lines and little bits of information about them. Kobe's on the board. I mean, all these people are on the board, and they're all being interconnected into all these little diagrams, if you will, charting out their connections and their revel- relevance and stuff like that. And... Dom's giving this speech to Darlene. She's saying, you know, they're, they're calling this Operation Python. And the reason was is because a python is a very patient creature. It waits slowly. It stalks its prey. And it waits slowly to surround the prey before striking. And she goes, you know, our, our break was, you know, you guys kind of messed up there. You know, Romero, <laughs> he probably thought it was Dark Army, but... No, it was just a stray bullet from a neighbor drug deal gone bad. And you guys were so shook by that. But all this, all that we're doing, everything, all the moves that we're doing is to catch the man in the middle. And the man in the middle is Ty Wellick, Tyrell Wellick. And Darling can't believe what she's seen. I mean, it's a very detailed whiteboard. There's actually... Two more whiteboards um, you can see um, to the side, to the right, and to the left with more information. I mean, it, the FBI knows. The FBI knows a lot. And I'm not quite sure why they've completely rounded everybody up, up and about yet, maybe because they couldn't find everybody. Oh, you know, Moby and Trenton are on the board, too. And Tyrell Wellick is dead center as the man in the middle, the man in charge of all of this, which we know not to be true. But Darlene's like, and, you know, that's the end of her storyline, hers and Dom's storyline in the FBI. I mean, she's caught. She's in FBI custody. She's going to be there for a while. She's probably going to get charged with something, most likely uh, a stolen gun because it's New York. In New York, they have extremely strict uh, gun laws there, so she could be facing some felony time. But the point of the matter is that, is that wow. The FBI has been on it. They haven't maybe put everything together, but they have a lot of information. And I'm just, you know, we'll just get into it a little bit. I do think that they're kind of lying, you know, Darlene to the FBI to try to flip her. You know, that's something that the FBI does. You know, we see all the work. We see that Darlene, we'll see whether or not this will get Darlene to turn on her brother. After all, she did love Cisco. She is in FBI custody. I I think she knows who Tyrell Wellick is beyond just the fact that he he used to work at uh, E Corp and that he's the man that everyone's blaming for the five nine hack. I think he's initially, or at least Darlene thought she, he was supposed to be part of the plan as of being a fall guy and not actually being part of the plan. I think Darlene, um, as you saw towards the end there with her and Cisco trying to find out what stage two is, that she's she's upset that she doesn't know all the plans that she doesn't know what's going on, that Elliot is hiding or lying to her, if you will. And so she might be a little upset by that. And I think there's an indication there, of just looking on the whiteboard, just the extent of what she doesn't know. And she knows a lot. She's supposed to be part of this. I mean, this is a revenge mission, if you will. I mean, all of it, it all centers, um, as we talk about Angela, 
going back to the Washington Township plant that made Darlene's father sick, that made Angela's father sick. She's on a mission. She told us to Susan Jacobs she wanted people to pay for her father's death. I mean, when her father died, she was left alone with her mother, who's very abusive to her. And not only that, but it wrecked her family, that lawsuit. They didn't get anything. They were almost destitute, if you will. Plus, her father died. I mean, they in her mind, they murdered her father. And so this is all about revenge. And not being able to enact that revenge, being in FBI custody, being maybe a little bit bitter about what's going on that she doesn't know about, she might flip. And I do believe she really, truly did love Cisco. And now he's dead. And the Dark Army might be what is, in fact, responsible for his death. An, an organization that they're, quote, unquote, supposed to be working for. Or with, I should say. The other thing I think the FBI is lying about, I mean, 6,000 plus agents working on this case. That's a lot of people. I don't think they know how Romero died. I think it's still up in the air question, but it's a good way to kind of drive a wedge into Darlene about it to kind of break her away from F society. But the problem for next season is to see whether or not Elliot will try to rescue her out of FBI custody if he finds out about it. Uh, you know, he does have that hero complex. Um, that's why he's doing all the things that he's doing. You know, will Dark Army and White Rose let him help get his sister out of custody? Or will they kill slash hold Darlene to keep Elliot on track? Uh, the FBI is definitely lying in wait for him and Angela. Uh, like I said, I don't believe there were Romero BS or how many agents are working on the case. But again, they do have a lot of intel, so they can start rounding people up and start putting a noose, if you will, or putting a lot more pressure onto the remaining members of F Society, or even a little bit, a little bit of pressure onto the Stage 2 plan. If they're able to knock things out, like wedge just a little bit, if you will, to put things out of sync. As far as Dom goes, I think she's right now she's kind of have to watch her back. I mean, if she flips during lean, it's going to put a significant wrinkle into the overall plan of the Stage 2 enactment, even if Darlene doesn't know what Stage 2 is. She also has to deal with the internal po politics of the FBI. I mean, solving this case could, in fact, jeopardize that $2 trillion no interest, ro interest loan that's supposed to solve all the economic woes that's happening to the world. So she is going to be in a very precarious position for Season 3. I do like the wrap-up for both of these character arcs. I like the fact that they're showing just how very competent the FBI is. So they're not just some um, bumbling fools. They're not just, you know, incompetent. They're actually a worthy adversary. They're they're on it. They're bloodhounds. They're they're seeking and finding and trying to arrest people and, and doing their job. And so it shows just the level of how grounded the series is into reality. I mean, a lot of these cases do, in fact, take time. They take in a lot of resources to solve. So I like the progression of her storyline. I like the progression of how she got to where she was as far as trying to solve this case. Um, again, I think that, that politics, which doesn't seem to be something that she's suited for, is going to bite her in the ass. As far as Darlene, I like to feel, feel that the mask that Darlene has been putting on, this kind of aloof, kind of cool girl, you know, exterior that she's projected, a little bit of a vulnerability to her as a character. But most importantly, her motivations are very clear and very dry and very ruthless. Um, like I've stated kind of repeatedly here with, with this, is she's here for revenge. She's here to kill people. She may not initially thought she was capable of doing it. Maybe she thought that someone would stop her, as she told Cisco in her confession. But that's what she wants. She wants blood, and she will do anything to get it done. And, there were, and right now, small mistakes that she has made, particularly that gun. If she never took that gun, I don't think she would be in that room right now. I think the FBA would have a hard time holding her. They may be able to watch her. They may be able to you know, force a very high bail to prevent her from getting out. But I don't think they'd be able to hold her. So her need, if you will, for that vengeance, her motivations, if you will, her ruthlessness, that that, that small mistake, if you if you can perceive it as such, is the reason why she's in this 
um, predicament. And it's a series of small mistakes, beginning with the fact that she didn't go down to D.C. to oversee the project. She, she, she basically passed the baton to somebody else, and clearly they weren't competent enough to, to get away, to go full throttle with the plan. If she had been there, I think they would have gotten away. They wouldn't have been caught. But because she wasn't there, she was a variable that just put everything askew. And all of this has to do with the fact that, again, she wanted her vengeance. She wanted to find out not only what stage two was, to get even further back at E-Corp, but eventually, you know, she wanted to be in that house in case Susan Jacobs shows up and so she can kill Susan Jacobs. And what I also like is a kind of a contrast, you know, Darlene is a very smart, capable woman, but she did, she's not the detailed-oriented, special person that Elliot is. And I think it's important because you can't have too many special people in the show because then it, it kind of gets exhausting, really, and then their specialness is not quite that special. So that's it, like I said, for those for that story arc and its impact. Again, I think for season three for the FBI, it's just a matter of just boxing people in and seeing how Elliot and Dark Army and the stage two plan um, maneuvers his way out of the box. As far as Darlene, it's going to be a big question mark of whether or not she's going to betray her brother or she's going to end up dying because of her brother. Speaking of Elliot, the entire season finale opens both parts with Elliot. The first opening scene is with Elliot at his apartment trying to trick his mind to trick Mr. Robot. Um, he talks about his friend Sam from childhood using a lucid dream technique called Mind Awake, Body Asleep. And once again, uh, two episodes in a row, um, a third episode this season, if you will, the audience has been brought into the show, and we have many voices doing this mantra, this chant of Mind Awake, Body Asleep. As Elliot is sleeping, we get all the other activities throughout the first episode of what everyone else is doing while Ellie is trying to trick Mr. Robot. And the reason why is because Elliot wants to know why he's at the apartment. What is Mr. Robot's plan? What's his end game? Because obviously Mr. Robot, once again, is hiding things from Elliot. So while Elliot wakes up and he sees Mr. Robot rummaging through the mail and picks up a menu, and it's the Red Wheel Barrel Barbecue Joint with a code message in it telling Mr. Robot to go to a location. So now Elliot is a silent observer, and he, he's following Mr. Robot. So he walks to the city, and, he, and you can see the city is still, as the brownouts are happening, things are still kind of erect. Um, there seems to be more people in and, in and about. You still see the, you know, the closed signs, the boarded up homes, the trash everywhere. And then he walks to uh, a swap meet in the park, which has these people trading and bartering and using Bitcoin to sell goods and services something that seems to be happening almost every night there, according to the signs. Uh, the city still kind of looks, you know, very bleak and kind of very dead, if you will. It's not the vibrant, bustling New York City that we've seen in almost every television and movie and game or any kind of media out there. It's, it's very dead. The 5-9 hack has halted the activity of a very major metropolitan uh, city. Also, when Mr. Robot and Elliot are walking to the swap meet, it looks like that Kobe was there shopping. Not sure if that was the case, but I just found that very interesting. So the brownouts, again, they're still happening. They're still happening throughout the, the episodes. And Elliot turns down the street, and he ends up losing Mr. Robot, and he starts panicking. But then he cools down and he realizes that he's Mr. Robot, so he hasn't lost Mr. Robot. He has to think, where could Mr. Robot be? And he notices a car parked at the very far end of the street, so he starts walking to it, and it's a cab. And he opens the door, and the cab guy is, are you Elliot? Are you Elliot? And cab, and Elliot's like, you here for me? And are you Elliot? So yeah. Elliot gets in the car, and it kind of flashes to him sitting as Mr. Robot and then reverting to Elliot. And then all of a sudden, the other side of the door opens up, and it's Tywell Wellick, and he gets into the car, and he tells the cab where to go. And Elliot starts freaking out. And Tyra Wallach starts talking to Elliot as Elliot's just, you know, mean mugging him. And he goes, you know, it's very dangerous for us, for us to meet like this, um, especially since we're so close to enacting our plan. 
and Elliot starts yelling at the cab driver. Um, the cab driver doesn't speak any complete English or proper English. He's, um, he's, you know, he's talking back to Elliot, and Elliot's like, "Do you see this man? Do you see this man next to me?" And he starts yelling at the cab driver to get him to acknowledge that is there somebody right next to him. And Tyra Wellick is starting like, "What are you doing, Elliot? What are you doing?" And and Elliot just keeps screaming and screaming and screaming until finally the cab driver just kicks both of them out of his cab and drives away. Uh, there's another big brownout, and Tyra Wellick was like, "What is wrong with you? What what's going on here with you, Elliot?" And Elliot is, you know, he's still freaked out. He thinks he's seen things, and he goes, "How are you here?" He goes, "The stage two, the plan is the plan is happening. All our dreams are about to come true." He, he gives uh, Elliot a uh, Casablanca quote, and that's the end of the first episode of Python, the first part of the season finale. The second episode, the, the second part, opens up with um, a reenactment, if you will, from the perspective of Tyrell Wellick, of that scene where, uh, from the first season where Tyrell Wellick was meeting with Mr. Robot, but this time around we see the real actual person, which is Elliot, and they're having that conversation. And... I've seen this YouTube video where there's a side 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 comparison of that exact scene of Christian Slater doing it the first time around and then Rami Malek doing it the second time around and it's just very eerie. They you know, Rami Malek captured that entire scene very, very well. I I might put a link in the show notes for it, but here we are and Tyra Wallach you know, he gets out of the car and he, and he kind of chases after Elliot and he's, he's like questioning everything. He's questioning why he himself is doing this, why Elliot is doing this, what the purpose of it is. And he tells Elliot, he has like a bit of a confession. He says that his father only spoke, he spoke very little English and all he knew was this silly poem about a red wheelbarrow. And that's because his father cited this poem, uh, Tyra Wellick knows it because his father did it all the time. And he says it to himself to remind himself that he never, ever wants to be like his father. His father, I guess, was just, you know, low class, if you will. He wanted to be something greater. And he's not sh- quite sure if Elliot's going to put him on that path for that greatness. It's a very weird and strange conversation about fathers, if you will, which is, has kind of been the center of the of the show, you know, Elliot worships Mr. Robot, his father, the image of his father, if you will. Angela has a very distant relationship with her father. Obviously, Tyra Wellick has contempt with his father. So, there's, you know, there's an underlying theme of fatherhood. Angela, we're not, really, not Angela, but uh, Darling, we're not really sure what her relationship is with her father. She was very young when he died. She was like four years old, if you will. So, you know, she was just, you know, her daddy was gone, basically. She might not have a really complete or a well-formed opinion on the matter. But, again, it remains to be seen how that's going to play out. So we cut into the present day, and we meet a technician at this building. He's in clean room attire, and... He opens the door and lets um, Elliot and Tyrell well again. And then Ty, they go up to the to the top floor or, or floor, if you will, into the building. And it's obvious that Tyrell Wellick has been staying there. And Elliot questions it. He goes, "Is this where you've been staying?" And he goes, "Yeah, our friends at the Dark Army set this up for us." And Elliot's like, "What? Well, what about your wife? Joanne Wellick is looking for you." And he goes, "I'm doing this for them." And he, and he goes, "Come on, Elliot." What's, what's up with you? What's wrong? And Elliot kind of sort of plays along, and Tyra Wellett breaks down, you know, the plans for stage two. He goes, look, look at the building across the street. I mean, I can't believe this is happening. And you can see these trucks roll into the building, and, and Tyra Wellett goes, and he says, those are the paper documents. And he shows a map to Elliot, and there's all these little pinpricks, if you will, on this map. And he goes, I really thought there was going to be 17 to 71 facilities around the country, but everything's now going to be centralized. They're going to put everything in this one building. And then he shows Elliot the uh, malware program. 
and Elliot's talking into his head and he's realizing what the malware program's going to do as he's looking at it. He goes, why are they doing the femtail cells? And then he realizes they need the femtail cells to as a power backup because of all the brownouts. They don't have enough electricity for that building. So if they have femtail cells and if you build up the hydrogen gas in the building, it can cause a fire and explosion. Then you realize that's why the brown nuts are happening. It must be the Dark Army doing it. Um, and because of this hackable power-up, they're able to destroy the, the paper backups. And he's he's not for this. And this is a little bit of a scene, too, of Mr. Robot shows up and Tyra Wellick and Elliot, and they're staring out the window. And Tyra Wellick's like, this is all for us. But Elliot, he, he doesn't want anything to do with this. He doesn't want to do with anything with Dark Army. He doesn't want anything to do with stage two. He also doesn't want to be killing people because obviously they'll be in the building with the hydrogen glass, gas buildup with the explosion. He, he wants this all done. He's going to basically destroy the malware so this plan doesn't get enacted. And Mr. Robot's there, and he is arguing with Elliot, and argues, Elliot's arguing back with him. He's like, you lied to me. You broke our deal. This is crazy. I'm not doing this. Mr. Robot's like, you need to calm down. This is our plan. This is our dream. We're almost there. This is stage two. This needs to happen. This is what everything's been building up for. And Elliot, you know, he goes to the computer that has the malware. He's sitting down, and he's going to destroy the malware. And Tyra Wellick sees him. And he's like, what are you doing? And Elliot's like, I'm, I'm stopping this. this. This can't happen. And Tyra Wellick he goes to a bag and he pulls out a gun. And Elliot looks at him. And Mr. Robot's yelling at Elliot, you need to get away from the computer. You need to stop what you're doing. And Elliot gets up and he goes, none of this is real. And Tyra Wallach's like, what are you doing? None of this is real. He's yelling at Mr. Robot. He's yelling at Tyra Wallach. None of this is real. You're not real. You don't have a gun. There's Darlene's gun. And Tyra Wallach's like, you gave me this gun. Because you said that I needed to stop anybody who wanted to stop this from happening. I just never thought it was going to be you. And Elliot's like, none of this real. You don't have a gun. Elliot looks at his hand like if the gun is there. He goes, it's not real. This is not happening. I'm the only real person here. I'm taking control of the situation. And he turns back around to go towards the computer and Tyra Wellick shoots him. And then Elliot pauses for a second because he's going to still make a step to go to the computer. But he realizes he can't because he actually really did get shot. Because Tyra Wellick was real. He was there the whole time. And he collapses to the ground. Tyra <laughs> Wellick collapses along with him. He kind of bends down. He goes, I didn't realize when you gave me this gun that you thought that I had to stop you from doing that, from, you know, destroying their plan. And Mr. Robot, it's like, Elliot, I was trying to tell you, you know. And he kind of pops out of existence. And then Elliot's eyes close and... He obviously is passing out. He's not dead, but he's passing out from the gunshot wound. So let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, I personally think that with the whole scene with Tyra Wellick and Elliot being shot, it seemed like a recreation would possibly might have happened at the FCS Society arcade location, but in reverse. And it can explain why there's a bullet on the ground at the arcade. You know, maybe Wellick freaked out about that about the hack and try to stop it, but gets shot and comes to his senses and recovers and can explain beyond him lying low why he there hasn't been a peep from him for almost ninety days. And Elliot coming up with the whole blood and the killing of Tyra Wellick um in his dream dreamscape sequence might explain that. Um again I said this before, you know I think Elliot knows that White Rose is part of the cover-up with the Washington Township plant, you know, killing his father. I think the brownouts now and the blackouts will not only affect the backup center, but the plant as well. I think Elliot is using Dark Army to take out Evil, out evil Corp in a way of exposing and luring White Rose out to the open. You know, she hacks time, he hacks people, and I do believe he has White Rose's number. Uh, it's only a matter if Elliot's able to keep everything together, all his parts, you know, Mr. Robot, uh, his original personality, the personality that he is right now, all his parts to make everything work. I think Elliot is very meticulous with a lot of his planning. The fact that stage two, he kind of figured out that they would centralize everything and put everything into 
one central location for the paper backup to restore the database. I think when he realized once you've encrypted the servers, once you've destroyed a server site, what what the next step would be, you know, how would you rebuild and figuring that out. I think his plan is pretty brilliant. It's just a matter of enacting it. But again, there's a lot of things that Elliot does that he does for a reason. For example, uh, back in season one when he um, pushed himself off of that pier and ended up in the hospital, he already had a plan in place that if he ever was hospitalized, he went to a specific hospital so that way he can manipulate the records, get the type of medication he needed, but also for it not to be trackable so that he he's not getting caught for having so much prescription drugs, if you will. It was a site that was easily manipulative, which makes me think that when he went into hibernation, if you will, when he went and pleaded guilty for uh, stealing that guy's dog, um, for hacking him and stuff like that, for violating his probation, that he made sure that he was under the care of Ray. Uh, I think Ellie made sure that he was under the care of Ray to take all those his coins, all those bitcoins. Because, you know, revolutions don't fund themselves, and if Ray's site was supposed to be like a silk road, then Elliot could, and F Society could be sitting in a cool 5K in Bitcoin. And, you know, the reason I bring this up is because e-coins being pegged to the dollar, you know, the big financial fall is going to happen. So they succeed in pulling off stage two, and technically e-corp doesn't have control of any assets. And neither do the people who are using e-coin as well. Um, this destruction will only cater greater e-corp but also the global economy again, but the e-coin is still price. So even with a true, true drilling dollar loan, the economy worldwide is going to collapse all around people, which again beg, begs the question of, which has been something I've been talking about throughout the season in my reviews, is whether or not Elliot and F, F Society are real heroes in all this mess. You know, just look at the death toll so far. We are only 90 plus days into after the hack and this revolution and bodies are piling up. Plus, we haven't seen the toll, the 5-9 hack, up close and personal. If anything, if it's anything like the real world global collapse of 2008, we should be seeing um, more of a mess. I mean, we do see in the background, we see the trash, we see the businesses closing, we saw Dom's deli guy having to close his business. We saw that incident with the woman where she's trying to say, you know, I own my home, I made my payments, I want to pull my money out of the bank. Uh, we also see Trent's family not sure if they actually own their home, per se, because of all the paperwork, all the issues. So the reason I bring this up, because of possibly for season three is, and we'll talk about the Washington Township plan um, in a separate, completely separate episode, because I think when we talk about it again, you know, final theory about that place is before season three, is I don't know that if it's going to be the ultimate show's MacGuffin, or a great big mind-blowing reveal. But with the collapse in the Yakimate Estate show, with the collapse of E-Corp, e it's not only going to crater the economy, it could even literally start a war. Because as Dom has said, you know, with China giving a $2 trillion loan to E-Corp, and if E-Corp were to go to bankruptcy, then, then the United States is on hook for that amount of money. And if they're on the hook for that amount of money and they, don't, and they don't have the means to pay it, it could start a war. Wars are started for less. And wars are always started, have been pretty much centered around resources. So that is something that can easily happen in this instance. As far as wrapping up, as far as the story arcs go, um, I like the fact that Tywell Wellock is still alive. I like the fact that he is not another personality of Elliot. So that would have been kind of fascinating. I also think that his coldness, Tywell Wellock's coldness, or his, not necessarily his coldness, but his absolute belief that what he is doing is for his wife and child, that he's a zealot, which goes back to the earlier scenes between Mr. Robot saying that Elliot was his god and Mr. Robot was the prophet, then Tara Wellick is a disciple, and disciples and zealots are always, whew, they're most, they are the most fanatical of members of any type of group, and their devotion is unquestionable. We see that with the fact that he shot Elliot how devoted he was, the fact that he's willing to sacrifice um, his wife and child or seeing his wife and child explains his devotion. The fact that he's on the run and he's hiding out in this like kind of a rat hole of a type of a place, considering how meticulous he dresses himself, how much of a wealth existence he's lived, explains 
to the fact that the sacrifices he's willing to make for this plan. So I like the fact that he's back in. I like to see how stage three is going to go. It seems that when I say three, but season three goes with him. It seems like he's kind of in charge of stage two. I do think that they need to explain his connection to, if he has one, to the Dark Army, or his time, that 90 day plus time, if they, they need to show something when it comes to that. As far as Elliot goes, the whole breakdown and just kind of breaking down the nature of Mr. Robot and himself, the, the duality of their personalities, I think is very important. I think the various different things that are happening in his life, from him being in the prison, his relationship with Angela, the fact that he has a need to save his sister, all these things um, that happen throughout the season, I think shows the, the depth of the, his characterization, but also the fact that he is on a hero's journey. He has a need to save people. He's going through all these different things uh, on the hero's journey, and there's these obstacles, and they're real obstacles. They're real world things that he has to navigate that he just he can't like like a superhero punch through. He has to use his mind. He has to manipulate people. He has to figure things out. And I think that's important because the first season it seemed that at the time that Elliot was like this superhuman, super level type of a person, like the ultimate hacker. He was getting away and getting out of everything. And now season two has kind of deflated that where you see that a lot of this was all very meticulously planned out, that he had these scenarios, if this happened, then I do this. If that happened, I do this, if this and that. They had a lot of this planned out and it wasn't like this superhuman ability of his. So I look forward to season three again. We'll talk about the Washington Township plant. We'll talk a little bit about White Rose when we talk about Angela. But I think it's important for me at least, that at some point the show has to got to acknowledge that Elliot Elliot knows White Rose is part of it. Angela knows now. And if all of this is about a revenge, then they need to kind of show that a little bit more. Because I'm I'm very uncertain with a character that has been shown to have the kind of intellect, intellectual level that Elliot has demonstrated, not being aware that White Rose is responsible for overseeing the Washington Township plan which sickened his father and caused his father to have the cancer and die. That's my only qualm with the the whole season two arc, that there wasn't that type of a revelation um, to Elliot directly to the audience, if you will. So that kind of wraps up his story arc. Um, now we're going to get into Angela. So Angela is in a van being driven by the same man and woman who picked her up at the subway after the, her conversation with Elliot. It's not the FBI like it's thought. Completely different people. Uh, they drive around a long time, long enough for Angela to have fallen asleep at some point in the back of the van. Uh, she did question the people that took her in, but uh, they won't answer her questions and completely ignore her. They eventually hit the suburbs and pull up to a home and drive into a garage and take her into a house. Uh, what's interesting about the house was that there's these pictures of the family on the wall and they seem to be like blotted out with like either post-it notes or some type of paint to cover up the faces. So Angela is taken to a room. So this room, she's placed in a room that's a very vivid machine feel to it. Uh, it's all black walls, red carpet. It has a fish tank with a fish in it. It's very huge. Um, inside of the wall, it's a uh, there's a desk with a Commodore computer, the book of uh, Loretta. An old school telephone, a hang in there cat poster from the 80s and 90s. We'll talk about that a little bit when we do the Angela conclusion. And a little girl walks in. Uh, she's dressed into a business suit, fires up the computer. Angela has asked some questions, but the girl ignores her. The game, the land of Iconia, comes onto the computer, and there are some questions on the screen. And she starts asking a question or a series of them to Angela, which is kind of an ode to the Blade Runner. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Boy Runner, it's a movie from the 80s. It starred Harrison Ford, Sean Young, um, directed by Ridley Scott, based off of the Philip K. Uh, short story called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. It's about um, these androids that flee from being in space and try to uh, live amongst humans, which is illegal. Harrison Ford is a character that's supposed to capture basically rogue androids. And there's a question, a series of questions that are asked of job applicants um, at a particular company that created the Android to make sure that they are not an Android. And if you don't answer these questions correctly, it's an indication of you not being human. So it's a very 
homage to that, if you will. Angela refuses to answer the question. So the girl shows Angela, stands up and shows Angela these bruise marks on her back and says that they will beat her if she doesn't answer the question. So Angela starts answering the question. She gets a series of questions about sex, about her life. There was one about a, um, an animal, like what kind of type of animal she is. And if you are a hyper observant observer of Mr. Robot, you might have already known, known the answer. I saw a post on Reddit that showed that during the first season of Mr. Robot, when Angela went to go visit her father, in the background um, throughout her father's home, there were these um, figurines of giraffes. So that's a hint, if you will, and the answer to that particular question and just how much heating the show Mr. Robot does for his characters, if you will. So Angela answer, answers these questions. It seems like she's in there for quite, quite a bit with the, the young girl. The fish tank is draining, which shows us the passage of time. About halfway through when they get to the final question about a key and ask her where the key is. And Angela is She's like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. The telephone rings, and then a computer-generated voice asks her the same question. So Angela finally answers the question. Then the little girl you know, closes up shop and leaves, and Angela's left there in the room. And she just kind of sits there for a while. You see the passage of time with the fact that the fish is dead, and then White Rose enters. And you know it's White Rose because she is always a striking figure, but you also hear that beat. And she sits down and she's smoking a cigarette, which is also kind of a homage, the way she's smoking it, to that of the Sean Young character from Blade Runner. And Angela's, like, you know, questioning why she's there, wondering who she is. And White Rose is like, look, my time is precious, more precious than yours. She goes, I only allowed it 28 minutes. And Angela's like, well, what is this for? And she's like, I'm going to let your boo. And so she, White Rose, and Angela have, like, this little tip for tat. And White Rose is like, you should be dead. I calculated it. You should have been dead after they hacked. But here you are, like a bad penny, turning up everywhere I look. You're not that special. I want to know what makes you special. And she's like, well, why are you doing this? Why are you hurting this little girl? She goes, ah, empathy. Questions were kind of a test for that. And she goes, it's just makeup and acting. And she's like, well, why are you keeping here, me here? And she's in the white room. She's like, I'm not keeping you here. She goes, well, the door's locked, is it? And White Rose goes, I'll be surprised at what obstacles people put in front, in front of themselves. And why did the locked door stop you from going anywhere? And Angela's, like, completely confused. And White Rose kind of breaks it down for her. She goes, you know, we're you, me, Elliot. We're all colliding forces together. All because of this one thing. The Washington Township plant. You know, you, Elliot's father died. Your mother died. And what if I were to tell you that their deaths were not in vain? Something greater was going to happen. And basically says that there was a purpose for it. That's just what Myra says. And she basically, again, she says to Angela that she wants Angela's belief. We don't know what that belief is um, because they cut away. And we see sometime later, um, Angela's in boss mode. And she pulls up to her lawyer's home. She's in a, a dark, I think it's dark limo type of sedan thing. The brownouts are still happening. And she knocks on the door, and it's her lawyer's home. And she tells her lawyer to forget about the voicemail that she left. Uh, she's dropping the case and not to contact her anymore. And the lawyer's looking at her very goofy. Because, I mean, she felt some yin and yang with Angela, you know. Angela coming with this case, presenting the information, getting the guys wanting to work on the case. You know, there's this whole back and forth, back and away off the case. Uh, and then coming back again. So she's like, did someone get to you? What's going on? Are you okay? She looks out the the door to see the car waiting there. She's like, are you okay? Everything? She goes, and Angela gives her a hug and goes, don't call me, and then walks away. And then we cut a little way further, and in the background, we're in Angela's apartment. Uh, in the background, there's a Let's Talk Frank on TV, and he thinks that the brownouts are a means of controlling people's means of communication. Um and so he explains his theory in the background here, and the telephone rings, and Angela answers it, and it's just a bunch of heavy, heavy breathing. And Angela tells me the voice on the other end that she was told that you'd be calling, and this is a secure line. And she knows what happened. And Tyrell was like, well, he's about to wake up, 
you know, you hear Tyrell Wallet's voice. You know, he's about to wake up, and I think he should know. I think he should have someone who loves him to be there. And she goes, okay, I'm going to be there. Kyra Wallace goes, I love him. And, and Angela goes, I love him too. And then Angela, you know, hangs up the phone and goes to leave, I guess, to go to Elliot. And the power goes out, and it's not a brownout. It's chaos in the street. It's a complete blackout now. And that is the the end of the, the season finale. Okay, so talk a little bit about Angela, and then we'll talk about White Rose. So how Angela is brought on board by whatever it is that White Rose told her. And I personally am not buying it. Angela wants someone to pay for her mother's death. She wants an understanding of why it is all happening. That's why she's pretty much on her own personal, when exactly quite call it vengeance mention, but she wants to know what the hell is going on with the Washington Township plant. And for White Rose to reveal to her that she is, that she is responsible for the Washington Township plant and in essence responsible for her mother's death and Elliot's death. I, I wouldn't sit well for me, personally. I don't think it would sit well with anybody, no matter what the type of relationship you might have with a parental figure. If someone told me that they died because there was a cure for all diseases, you name it, it's, it's done, or aliens came to the world, you know, because of the sacrifice or the death of your parents. Or immortality, you know, name, insert whatever the big reveal would be. I would be still stabbing a bitch. It's just, just my personal feeling. And I think Angela is the same way. I think Angela is probably the most adaptable character on the show. She just rapidly adapts to the, to the type of environment she's in. She goes from all safe to, you know, being the head of the project to being kind of pushed out to taking the fall with a DAT file so she can get the information she needs from Kobe to being part of E-Corp to eventually uh, getting those uh, clauses in the lawsuit uh, dropped to jumping into the mortgage end of the business, if you will, like a step down so that she can eventually, you might say, get the information she wants from the Was- about the Washington Township plant to the nature of her job in E-Corp where she was able to uh, get the type of interview that Mr. Philip Price wanted. All these different things. Whatever is thrown at her, she's able to overcome the obstacle, adapt, adjust, adjust to the scenes, adjust to the personal issues that she has in her life, whether it be her ex douche boyfriend to the guys that she's casually sleeping with to the old men that she packed up picked up at the bar, to even the fact that she infiltrated the FBI for, as well as the, that office, the vice president's office, so she can get those, those documents, to go into the nuclear regulatory, like, she just adapts to the situation, and I think she's adapting here. I mean, she's just very adaptable, she's very adjusting, and she is goal-oriented. She wants to protect herself, she wants to be able to pay her bills, and she wants to know what happened to her mother. She wants that solution. And if it means going along with whatever White Rose told her and figuring out what's going on with F Society and Elliot, she's going to do that. And I also think she wants to protect Elliot a little bit. I don't know if she feels responsible for Elliot, but Elliot is definitely very important to her. And so that might be an extra motivation for her. As for White Rose, again, we'll we'll talk about the Washington Township plant in a a separate theory episode now that it's concluded. Again, I don't know if it's going to be like some big, major, huge scientific revelation, if you will, whether it be the one theory I had about ultimate power, like energy, as far as that goes. Um, there's a big Reddit theory about androids we might talk about, or the fact that it might be the ultimate MacGuffin, and we'll get into why I think that is that is the case. But it seems that, again, White Rose is very mission-oriented herself about keeping control of this plant and doing whatever is necessary to do so. That includes giving that $2 trillion no interest loan to Philip Price and tolerating his solution for the e-coin thing. At the same time, she's doing this whole stage two stuff. I mean, there's a lot going on with the White Rose. You know, she, the Dark Army took out Cisco. Uh, they took out those FBI agents. She is responsible for keeping Tyrell Wellick off the map, if you will, uh, get, setting up the location so they can take down 
uh, all those paper documents. There's a lot going on with her, and I hope in season three we see more of her boss-like plan, if you will. I mean, we've seen a lot of Bill Price and his boss plan, but I think it would be interesting to see um, White Rose's boss plan so we can see what type of an adversary that she is, because I, I don't believe her to be on the side of Ellie or at society or anyone's side. She's definitely on her own side, and it would be interesting to see more revelations um, when it comes to season three about her. I do like that they did add a more layer. I like the fact that they found out that uh, she's a prominent she has a prominent position within the Chinese government. That she is indeed in charge of the Dark Army. That's a confirmation that she has a very long term relationship when it comes to E E Corp, if you will. And that she is the center of this whole Washington plant thing. That that was a big revelation and I kinda like that story arc for her. With Angela, again, I just like the way she's been able to adapt to the whole entire situation as far as her story arc. I like the fact that she, the position is now that she is a, a partner, if you will, into this endeavor about the F-Society, about the mission itself. I kind of like the fact that she's been brought in and she's not on the outside, that Elliot is not trying to protect her. She's not like a, a princess, if you will. She's quite capable of taking care of herself and that she has... Um, her own means of doing things. Uh, she might not be a hacker to the level of Darlene or Elliot, but she does know how to manipulate people. She does know how to use the business, social engineering, if you will. She knows how to get things done. And I like that, that. I like the fact that that was showcased here this season. So that's pretty much the conclusion for my season overview, uh, or review of the, the season finale. As far as the rest of the podcast shows go, uh, again, I'm going to be doing a Washington Township plant uh, episode. I'm going to talk about the uh, extra stuff that's been going on, like the Telltale games, the book, and the uh, RG game that's happening with the Mr. Robot. I will be doing an episode about eCoin and corporate coin and Bitcoin, the difference between the two and how their real world implications and how they're influencing the show. And then finally, it'll be like uh, my season three hopes and dreams, if you will, or maybe a couple theories. So there's going to be an e-coin episode, uh, another Washington Township Part 5, if you will, episode, an episode about the, um, the extra stuff that the, the show is doing, and then end in with the Season 3 until Season 3 happens uh, show. So four more episodes will be happening on um, the feed. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please subscribe, share, rate, and review on any of the podcast apps they use, whether it be iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or inside um, any uh, podcast app catcher you have, just recommend, if you will. Uh, you can find the show on Twitter at SSIDRC. You can also email the show if you have any questions or any thoughts at SSIDRC at protonmail.com. Also, uh, review the show, and if you're Five stars and good. I will, uh, in the item reviews or on Stitcher, I will um, talk about it on the, in the show and give you a shout out. Again, thank you very much for your listening and your patience. And until next time. This has been a Ferocious Shine based on Steve Network production.